Hello, everybody. It's me, Fee, White Zulu. And I'm going to give you a little bit more from my autobiography of the same name. I gave you chapter 10 last time, describing how I used to run absolutely wild. My parents never knew where I was. And this is chapter 11, following on from chapter 10. And it's called Zulu Legislation and Traditions. To me, Evelina was old, but I think she must have been about 35 when she became my nanny. Traditionally, Zulu maidens were sold as brides at the age of 13 or 14 and bore their first children soon afterwards. So Evelina could have been anything up to five could have had anything up to five children. Infant mortality was as high as the birth rate of her own in, back in Mbenta, being cared for by her own mother. Evelina's age was difficult to determine. She was illiterate, as were all our staff, and Zulus in those times anyway didn't register the births of their children. The villages were, are too remote for a newly delivered mother to trudge over 40 miles of mountainous, look behind me at the photograph of part of my farm. It's where the baboons roost at night. Mountainous and sometimes leopard inhabited country to the closest municipal registry, our nearest was in Lands River, about 50 miles away. Burdened down by her previous baby, now a year old, strapped to her back in a shawl, her newborn infant in her arms, and often with several other very small children in tow. Excuse me. <coughs> The mother might even already be pregnant with her next baby, as the only form of population control among rural Zulus was a very high infant mortality rate. Anyway, the Africans didn't see the point of this Omlungu number keeping. They knew who was in their tribe, and as they did with their cattle, they knew them by the shade of their skins instead of by counting, which they couldn't do unless they had been taught at a mission school. As an old age pension was issued to all natives over the age of 60, the recipient had to produce some kind of physical identification to receive it. There was the official system whereby every month the pensioner would be taken by their relatives to Lands River, often in a wheelbarrow, in a journey taking several days. Excuse me, <coughs> this cold will not leave me. And Faga Ustupa, place an inked thumbprint under an X instead of a signature in their pension book to collect the allowance in pounds sterling. Wily older relatives over their late 30s would cut off the right thumb of their parents' corpse before they performed the three-day burial ceremony, pickle the thumb in mess, <coughs> excuse me, and by secreting the legitimate digit under their own, kept drawing pensions for their long deceased elders for years, as it was very difficult to determine the age of a Zulu. They don't wrinkle or lose their hair, and only some of them turn a little bit grey at the temples. The logistics of the Afrikaner government officials keeping track of the numbers of births and deaths 
those weren't registered either, on natives, their collective word for Africans, although we and the Afrikaner clerks were all born in South Africa as well, in the rural areas were too much to overcome. Occasionally, the Afrikaner officials became suspicious and did some investigation only when some of these old Zulus reached ages which surpassed any of those in the Guinness Book of Records. Jormela, our herdsman, was old because his thinning curls were grizzled white at the temples, like our Induna Ngiti and Makai, and he'd lost most of his teeth. Like Makai and Lokatia, he didn't have a Christian name, and he lived in his own hut with his wife and children up on top of the farm and looked after the 5,000 head of sheep which grazed on the felt up there all year round, except when there was a forecast of heavy snow in the winter, when Dad sent a message via one of the farm labourers to him to bring all bring them all down to the valley where the bush afforded them good shelter and grazing. Evelina loved me as if I was one of her own children and I loved her too. But my mother's rules had to be strictly enforced and Evelina was terrified of my mum's volatile temper and the fact that she could be fired on the spot and replaced with any of the other Zulu women who worked on the farm. I wouldn't sit still or play games with my younger sister's dolls. So Evelina turned a blind eye to my slipping away, excuse me, <coughs> I'm sorry about this, and then spent the whole day worrying she'd lose her job. Very occasionally, my mother prowled around to check on us, perhaps once or twice a year. And early one day, she crept up on Evelina to find her testing the temperature of the milk in Delia's bottle by taking a swig from the teat instead of putting a few drops onto the inside of her wrist as she'd been taught. My mother exploded. Evelina nearly jumped out of her skin with fright and, although she didn't get the sack, for the rest of her time as our nanny, it must have preyed on her mind that her job was hanging by a thread. Fortunately, fortunately for me, my mother was too engrossed in her gardening to check on me. And for my first 11 years, she never knew what I was up to. If there was any need for me to be called back to the house, Evelina left Delia with Leeshaw and came to look for me, calling in that special, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> hilltop calling voice all the Zulus used to communicate over long distances. Her voice carried along the valley and bounced off the mountain sides, and I was able to sense by the urgency in the tone of her cries to hurry and meet her. I didn't want either of us to get into trouble. Our staff came from Mbendla, the Zulu settlement, bigger than a normal sized village of round thatched huts perched on a, hall, a hillside, which lay on the escarpment behind our farm. <clears throat> All their front entrances faced the east, and it looked as if the huts were peering out over the valley into the sunrise. Up there lived the chief, excuse me, <coughs> I hate this. I'm sorry about this. Up there lived the chief, the Induna, who ruled over the tribe. And it was to him 
that everybody deferred. When Mackay wanted a wife, for instance, he dressed up in his best clothes. I remember a well-cut brown tweed shooting jacket with discreetly understated suede elbow patches and baggy khaki drill long trousers. Car stuffs from my father's 1930s Jesus College Cambridge wardrobe. On another occasion, I recall, he wore a perfectly tailored dark Savile Row suit with an almost imperceptible pinstripe. Since he and my father had a similar build, a slight build, it looked as though Mackay himself had stood to be measured for the suit in that London tailor's fitting rooms. He spent his weekend off in his kraal, going hat in hand to say, see the chief to ask his permission to marry the girl whom he'd been courting. He carefully wrapped his hand-me-down brogues, polished to a mirror shine, in a couple of sheets of old newspaper, and packed them into a satchel he'd made for himself from the skin of a bushbuck, with a pattern of black and white porcupine quills he'd threaded festively through eyelet holes bored into the hide. He'd added a trim of speckled guinea fowl feathers to complete the effect. He placed his rather battered and definitely faded old brown felt trilby hat, another sartorial treasure from my father's university days, on his closely shorn peppercorn curls, bent over to roll up the cuffs of his trouser legs, to reveal skinny black ankles and horny bare feet and carefully padlocked shut the door of his little room built onto the back of our garage. He hoisted his cheerfully fluttering bag over his shoulder and strode off with me following closely at his heels. We listened to the calls coming from the other Zulu staff also going off for a weekend's leave. And he answered so that his voice ricocheted around the valley, arranging where to meet up with the other members of our farm staff. They collected at the cow buyer, about seven of our staff, men and women, all dressed in their best clothes. Some of the younger girls in the traditional Zulu or Beishu, a small apron of beads or an animal skin hand sewn and covered in colourful beadwork around the waist. Bare breasts and many bracelets and necklaces. I was left standing at the farm boundary to watch them disappear up the mountainside behind our milking shed, feeling like a puppy who had been told to stay at home. I would have given anything to follow that cheerful, chattering group home to Mbentle to see their grandparents, who had worked for Grandpa and were now retired, sitting comfortably on woolen blankets, backs leaning against the sun-baked mud and dung walls of their huts while their daughters brought home rations from dad, carrying the big sacks on their head, mealy meal to make amacheu corn beer, and uputu, sacks of brown sugar, tea, coffee, and meat, as well as gallons of skimmed milk. There would be other treats too, sweets for their grandchildren, bread, and Coca-Cola bought with their wages from the local Indian run store up there. Please, can I come with you? I pleaded. No, we're sorry, Ngozizan. 
They seem generally regretful. You have to stay here at home with Lee Shaw. Sadly, I watched them move into single file to walk through the Umgeni Port Pass, just a steep, rocky, single pony track which took them above the Nuns and Wakefield, and finally along the back of the Intlazan Peak to their home in Mbenla. Then I walked slowly and reluctantly back to the farmhouse, moodily scuffing my bare feet in the dust. Permission was granted for Mackay to marry the girl, and it usually was after some sort of gift, probably money, had been passed over. Mackay then had to go to see the father of his intended bride. There, he sat with the older man in his hut, and they discussed Ulobola, the bride price. In those days, 20 head of cattle was an acceptable price for a good, strong, healthy and attractive young maiden. It was a proud moment when the father and his prospective son-in-law shook hands on the deal. And that was the signal for the women of that kraal to bring in calabashes of amacheu. Some of them wives of the bride's father and any sisters she might still have living there. The bride-to-be shyly came in to join them and, kneeling obediently, offered her future husband the first swig from the gourd of beer she carried. Finally, a goat was slaughtered and roasted to seal the pact and celebrate the betrothal, and everybody feasted and drank to the happy event. After the weekend of joy and celebrations, Mackay had to skitter and scrabble his way down the steep mountain and walked back to the farm to have a quiet word with my father. It was arranged that, in lieu of some of his salary, he could have two newborn bull calves and a couple of heifers from my father's stock. This worked well, as our herd was a particularly good one. A cross between Aberdeen Angus, good hardy beasts, carrying a fair amount of meat, and Simmentaler, a Swiss breed, which were huge. There was also a strain of Brahman added in to produce strong and really heavy cattle with great powerful humps, which would have won prizes at the Royal Agricultural Show in Peter Maritzburg, if my father had been bothered to enter them. Historically and traditionally, Zulus kept Inguni, scrub cattle, smaller rangy beasts with long horns and an attractive pale mottled hide. These were resistant to most bush, tick and fly carrying diseases, and they seemed to manage on fairly poor grazing but they didn't carry much meat on their bony bodies. My father's cattle needed a fair bit of attention with regular dipping and inoculations. And on those days, Mackay could bring his own little herd along to be treated immediately after the herdsmen had finished with my father's and the local Roman Catholic convent nuns cattle witch doctors. One day, as the Zulus went about their work, there was a flurry of excitement and the buzz of conversation about a Sangoma coming. What's a Sangoma? I asked Evelina that evening as she bathed Delia and me. It's the witch doctor, she said, scrubbing at my feet which were ingrained with dirt from running about barefoot all the time. 
I squirmed as the nail brush tickled my leathery soles. We're getting a visit from a Sangoma from Mbantla. Somebody has asked one to come here to give them some information. Perhaps they've lost something precious or they have a problem they want fixed. The Sangoma will throw the bones and they will show them what they need to know. What sort of bones? I asked. I don't know. It's all to do with Umuti. She shuddered involuntarily, although the bathroom was warm and steamy. We'll soon find out, though. Will I be able to go and see them doing the bone moti? I persisted, but Evelina wasn't to be drawn any further. She inspected the soles of my feet. She was short-sighted and had to peer at them closely. Keep still. Where will the Sangoma stay? I enjoyed anything new that cropped up in our uneventful day-to-day -day lives, however irrelevant it was to me. I don't know yet, perhaps in somebody's hut, the person who she has called, called them. Sorry, the person who has called them. Now jump out so I can dry you, she said. As I lay in bed that night, I recalled a dim, distant memory of a witch doctor whom Grandpa had summoned to sort out a stock theft problem he'd had once, long ago. I must have been about three years old, and I remember it was a crisp winter's morning. Although the sun's rays had warmed the farmyard there, sorry, the farmyard, there was still sparkling white frost lying on the long grass in the shade of the old dry stone wall which enclosed his fowl run. A milking cow had mysteriously gone missing from Grandpa's herd, and he'd assumed it had been so stolen. So he sent word to a local witch doctor to come and find the culprit. My older sisters and I stood well back behind him as his five farm labourers, summoned from their morning jobs, shuffled nervously to form a line in front of him. They had respectfully removed their faded cotton hats, which they now twisted anxiously in their calloused black hands. Waving his walking stick to indicate the low stone wall, Grandpa told them to sit in a row and keep still. Still wielding a stick ex expansively to illustrate various points, Grandpa proceeded in his fluent Zulu to tell the little group lined up on the stone wall how he discovered his cow was missing and what he was about to do to find out who'd stolen it. Tension built up perceptibly as he carried on describing what he'd planned. The men shifted nervously on the wall, showing the whites of their eyes as they glanced at one another, hoping, I suppose, that somebody would own up before the ordeal began. Then the witch doctor appeared in full regalia with the skins of small animals, feathers, multicolored beads, and blown up dried sheep's ballad bladders flapping from his head and body to stand in front of the group next to my grandfather. Quietly, the witch doctor said to Grandpa, the guilty one will fall off the wall backwards. The arrival of the witch doctor seemed to strike terror into the five Zulus who sat on the stone wall 
statues still in their overalls and gumboots, eyes fixed in front of them like condemned men. The interrogation began in rapid Zulu, during which the witch doctor flung his mm. hander out at the group several times, indicating that he was putting a tagati, a spell on them. He might even have thrown some substance like a powder at them. I don't remember. Suddenly, one man plummeted backwards off the wall with a frightened yell, landing on his back in the foul run behind him. We all gave a startled jump, especially the men on either side of him. Guilty, said the witch doctor succinctly. Grandpa was delighted that the money he'd spent on the procedure had had such a good outcome and happily paid the witch doctor his fee. The cattle thief had revealed himself. Grandpa recovered his stolen cow, and the whole event served to deter any other would-be cattle thieves. The following morning after the rumour about the witch doctor arriving, I ran off to play with Kupane, the cook woman's boy. He was eight and lived with his parents in one of the small round mud huts up at the kraal. His father was a labourer and his mother cooked the food for all the single male workers who lived in a long oblong hut called the Putukaya, a sort of dormitory where they slept and ate. We'd been told by both our parents and from our manager's wife, Mrs. Bannertime, and even Evelina, that we were never allowed to go anywhere near there, not even walk along the road which passed in front of the Iputukaya. But I nipped in once anyway, purely, purely out of curiosity to see why it was so expressly forbidden. It was almost pitch dark and extremely sp smoky in there, as there were no windows at all, and certainly no chimney, just the small front opening which served as an entrance, with the home-made door propped open. As my eyes adjusted to the gloom, all I could see were two rows of makeshift wooden beds, each covered in an army blanket and with pillows made from hessian sacking stuffed with hay. The beds were ranged against the long walls, all the legs set in jam tins and then propped up on bricks to keep the tokolosh away. I'd long ago asked Evelina and Leeshaw why they insisted on raising the legs of their beds on bricks. To keep the tokolosh away was the emphatic reply. What's a tokolosh? I asked. It's a small black mischievous demon which comes out at night when you're asleep and does bad, bad things to you. They can't climb up bricks, though, so that's why we put them under the bed legs. What sort of bad things, I persisted. But everybody just pressed their lips together, shook their heads and changed the subject. Each of the four wooden hand-cut legs were first placed in a used tin, some with baked beans or pilchards and tomato sauce labels still on, filled with an unidentified liquid, probably paraffin, to keep ants, scorpions and other creepy crawlies from climbing up into the bed. A wood fire burned in a circle of big stones in the middle of the dung floor, and as my eyes began to sting and weep from the dense smoke coming off it,
I felt something tickling and then biting my ankles and ran quickly outside again into the bright morning sunlight. Looking down, I saw what appeared to be crawling black socks over my bare feet and ankles. Fleas. Hundreds of them had latched on and were biting my skin. The itching was unbearable and I fled to the standpipe to run icy cold water over my legs and ankles, frantically scrubbing them off. Half a dozen of the Uputu Kaya residents were sitting on a log backs to the sun wall, warmed wall of their hut, enjoying their breakfast. A plate of Uputu scooped from the big black iron three-legged pot over the fire in front of the doorway. This was one of the three daily meals of Uputu Kupani's mother made for them with a dollop of amasi on top, that soured curdled milk. A tin cup of well-brewed coffee was placed carefully on the hard-baked, clean-swept ground next to each man. And they all burst out laughing as I danced and hopped, scraping at the fleas in disgust. Oh, Ngosazani, that's why Ngosikazi and Ndlovu told you never to go in there. And they slapped their thighs and cackled and shook their heads, wiping away tears of mirth. Some of them mimicking my slapping motions with their brown work hardened hands. They eased themselves to their feet as the farm bell rang for them to start their day's work, showing pink gums as they yawned widely, stretching their arms over their heads and arching their backs. And still chuckling, they made their way to, way to collect their pangas, machetes, for a long morning slog, hacking pungent smelling bonga bonga from the riverbanks. Gopani and I each had a dinky car. I'd given him one of mine. And the previous afternoon, he'd said that they needed servicing. He was waiting for me at the workshop, and we both poked around in all the tins and containers on the wooden workbench, looking for axle grease. Nothing there, said Gopani. We'll have to go and look under the jeep. He crawled under our old war issue American Willie's Jeep and scraped some black grease off the back axle. Right, now we must do our cars. We were squatting under the gum trees next to the standpipe up at the huts in the shade, working grease into our car's axles. When I saw somebody approaching slowly up the path, it was the strangest apparition I'd ever seen in my life. She was a large middle-aged Zulu woman, and there was nothing uncommon in that. It was what she was wearing that made me stop what I was doing and stare, my mouth open in amazement. She wore several animal skins, some of which I recognised as those of spotted genets and banded mongooses, sewn together to make a voluminous flapping skirt. Over her shoulders she had draped a cape of black back jackal skin, long bushy black tail and all, and pinned to her shoulder like a brooch was the head of a recently killed chicken or a bizarre headdress of other strange materials of which I recognised only one, a python skin. Festooned around her neck and waist were strings 
onto which she threaded the dried vertebrae of many different small wild animals, seed pods which looked like dried bloated blue ticks, scarlet carapaces of beetles, ladybirds, and more and more pieces of snake skin. She had necklaces of traditional Zulu beads too, but not in any patterns and colours I'd ever seen before. The strangest effect of all was the dried sheep's bladders. She'd blown up about a dozen of them so that they looked like grey, semi-opaque balloons and tied them to her headdress and around her upper body and waist. They flapped alarmingly as she walked and as she walked, and the bones rattled loudly with every movement she made. I stood there gaping at her. Kupane, I turned to my friend, but he was gone. He must have bolted into the nearest hut. I stood up to greet this apparition. I may have been slightly apprehensive, but I still had my Zulu manners. I put both hands forward, the right one just above the left, to Kaula, shake hands, and, as is the custom, bent my knees in a little bob. Saubona, I said. I didn't know what title to address the stranger. So I left it at that. She replied with, Saubono mtuanga umtuana umlongo. Greetings, child of a white man. <coughs> Excuse, <me. coughs> Excuse me. I beg your pardon. <coughs> An odd way to describe me, since everybody on and even off the farm called me Ngosazana, the chief's daughter. This person obviously didn't know anything about us. She looked imperiously around at our surroundings, the cluster of round thatched mud huts in which the farm staff lived. As she turned her head, the sheep's bladders bobbed and her skins rustled with a crackling noise. Where is everybody, she asked. I looked around as well and discovered the place was deserted. More to come. This is enough for this time. I will continue with this story. True, I am part of my life and something I've never forgotten. I want to thank John Muslane for being my sound engineer and enabling me to do this, these broadcasts. And I'd also be very happy if you went to my website, www.whitezulubook.com, where you'll see plenty of photographs um, that are in my book and, and many others as well. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed it and goodbye.